we have a crisis in the world, tremendous crisis, and also crisis in our consciousness, in us. I see the urgency of change, radical revolution, mutation in the mind. I see it. It is necessary. There is complete quietness of the mind, and that which is silent has vast space. Only then that which is nameless comes into being. This is Urgency of Change, the Krishnamurti podcast. The real meaning of the word art is to put everything in its right place so that the mind is liberated. Hello and welcome to episode 109 of Urgency of Change. Season 3 of the Krishnamurti podcast continues with the format of carefully chosen extracts from the philosopher's talks. Each weekly episode focuses on a theme explored by Krishnamurti and the aim is to represent his different approaches to these universal topics. This week's theme is The Arts of Looking, Listening and Learning. Upcoming themes are Sorrow, Dialogue and Energy. This is a podcast from Krishnamurti Foundation Trust. Please visit our website at kfoundation.org where you can find a growing collection of in-depth articles on Krishnamurti's teachings, along with key topics and a wide selection of quotes. Our online store stocks all available Krishnamurti books and ships worldwide. You can also find our daily quotes and videos on Instagram and Facebook at Krishnamurti Foundation Trust. If you enjoy the podcast, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, which helps its visibility. This week's episode on the arts of looking, listening and learning has five sections. The first extract is from the fourth talk in Ojai, 1977, titled In the art of listening, there is freedom. I think we ought to understand something very clearly and simply. The art of listening. The art of seeing. And the art of learning. The word art is generally applied to artists those who paint, those who write poems, do sculpture, and so on. But the meaning of that word, art, means giving everything its right place, putting all our thoughts, feelings, anxieties and so on in their right place. So the word art means giving their proper place, proper proportion, putting everything in harmony, not just paint a picture or write a poem. So, if you will, this morning, apply the art, the art of listening. We rarely listen to anybody. We are so full of our own conclusions, our own experiences, our own problems, our own judgments. So we have no space in which to listen. 
we ought to have some space so that as two friends, you and I, the speaker, are talking over together their problems, amicably, amicably under the shade of a tree, sitting down and looking at the mountains, but concerned with their problems. And so they are willing to listen to each other. And to listen is only possible when you put aside your particular opinion, your particular knowledge or problem, your conclusions, when you are free to listen, not interpreting, not judging, not evaluating, but actually the art of listening, to listen with great care, attention, with affection, And if we have such an art, if we have learned such, rather, if we are capable of such listening, then communication becomes very, very simple. There will be no misunderstanding. Communication implies to think together. to share the things that we are talking about together, to partake in the problem as two human beings living in a monstrous, corrupt world where everything is so ugly, brutal, violent and meaningless. It's very important, seems to me, if I may point out, that in the art of listening, one learns immediately. One sees the fact instantly. And if, you, if one listens rightly, as we point out the meaning of that word, right, correctly, accurately, not what you think is right or wrong, but in the art of listening, there is freedom, and in that freedom, every word, every nuance of word big, has significance and there is immediate comprehension, which is immediate insight and therefore immediate freedom to observe. Also, there is the art of seeing, to see things as they are, not as you wish to see them, to see things without any illusion, without any preconceived judgment, opinion, to see actually what is, not your conclusions about what is. Then the art of learning, not memorizing, which becomes very mechanical, because our minds, our brains have already become so extraordinarily mechanical. So the art of learning implies freedom to observe, to listen, without prejudice, without argumentation, without any emotional or romantic responses. If we have these three arts, not merely 
as a verbal conclusion or an intellectual comprehension. But actually, in our daily life, to put everything in its right place, where they belong, so that one can live a really very quiet, harmonious life. But that is not possible. If you have learned this art of giving things their proper place, The second extract is from Krishnamurti's sixth talk in Madras, 1978, titled There is a Great Miracle in Listening. When you listen, and when there is resistance to what is being said, that, is a, that resistance is the outcome of your pressure. You don't listen. Not that you must accept. Nor must you reject, but just to listen without resistance, without translating what is said into what you would like it to be. So to learn the art of listening. I think if you know that, the thing is very simple, it's almost over. Because there is a great miracle in listening. Because in that, if there is no interpretation of what you are hearing, or make an abstraction of what you are hearing, or turn it into an idea and pursue that idea, then you are off the mark entirely. But if you listen with your heart, with care, with attention, with affection, then that very listening is like a flowering. There's beauty in that listening. Because, as we said the other day, art means to put everything in its right place. And the same way, to observe, to observe the world as it is, the outer world, with all the misery, poverty, degradation, vulgarity, the brutality and the appalling things that are going on in the scientific world, in the technological world, in the world of religious uh, organizations the crookedness, the ambition, money, 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 and power, all to observe all this without bringing your personal condemnation or acceptance or denial, just to observe it. Have you ever observed a cloud? Have you? A cloud of an evening is full of light and colour, great beauty, to just to observe it without verbalising it, without uh, wanting to see the beauty, just to observe. And then from the outer to observe equally that which, you are, which is going on inwardly, which your thoughts, your ambitions, your greed, your envy, your violence, your vulgarity, your sexuality, all that, just to observe. And then you will see, if you so observe, that thing flowers, your greed flowers and dies. There is an end to it. You are never greedy again, because the flower is dead withered, because you have let it come out and 
die naturally. And also to learn the art of learning. Learning implies generally, for most of us, accumulation of knowledge stored up in the brain like a computer and act according to that knowledge. That's what we call learning. It is generally accepted. The meaning of that word is generally that. But we are introducing something entirely different, which is to learn without accumulation. That is, just a minute, I'll show it to you now. I said to learn without accumulation, to learn means to have an insight into the fact. Now, insight implies grasping the full significance of your, say for instance, your greed, grasping the full nature and the structure of greed. See, having an insight into it, a, a comprehension, a total comprehension of that reaction called greed. When you have an insight, there is no need to learn. It is you are beyond it. The third extract is from the second talk in Colombo, 1980, titled Listening to the Story of Mankind. The whole story of mankind is in you. The vast experiences, the deep-rooted fears, anxieties, sorrow, pleasure, and all the beliefs that man has accumulated throughout the millennia. You are that book. That's what we said yesterday. And it is an art to read that book. It's not printed by any publisher. It's not for sale. You can't buy it in any bookshop. You can't go to any analyst, because his book is the same as yours. No to any scientist. The scientist may have a great deal of information about matter and the astrophysics, but his book, The Story of Mankind, is the same as yours. That what we said yesterday afternoon. And Without carefully, patiently, hesitantly reading that book, you will never be able to change the society in which we live. The society that is corrupt, immoral, there is a great deal of poverty, injustice, and so on. Any serious man concerned with the things as they are in the world at present, with all the chaos, corruption, war, the greatest crime, which is war, 
and in order to bring about a radical change in our society and its structure, one must be able to read the book, which is yourself, and that society is brought about by each one of us, by our parents, grandparents, and so on. All human beings have created this society. And when this society is not changed, there will be more corruption, more wars, and greater destruction of the human mind. That's a fact. So, to read this book, which is yourself, one must have the art of listening to what the book is saying. That is, to listen to it. Which means to listen implies not to interpret what the book is saying, just to observe it, as you would observe a cloud. You can't do anything about the cloud, nor the palm leaf swaying in the wind, nor the beauty of a sunset. You cannot alter it, you cannot argue with it, you cannot change it. It is so. So one must have the art of listening to what the book is saying. The book is you, so you can't tell the book what it should reveal. It will reveal everything. So that must be the first art to listen to the book. And there is another art, which is the art of observation, the art of seeing. When you read the book, which is yourself, there is not you and the book. Please understand this. There is not the reader and the book separate from you. The book is you, so you are observing the book, not telling the book what you should say. Is that, am I making this clear? That is, to read, to observe all the reactions that the book reveals. To see very clearly, without any distortion, what the lines, the chapters, the verse, the poems, the beauty, the struggle, everything that it is telling, revealing. So there is the art of seeing, and the art of listening. There is also another art, the art of learning. The computers can learn. They can be programmed and they will repeat what it has been told. If a computer plays with a master of chess, the master may beat it two or three, four times, but it is learning. Where it has made a mistake, where it can correct it, so through experience it is learning so that after a few games, the computer can beat the master chess player. That's how our mind works, our mind. 
we first experience, accumulate knowledge, store in the memory, in the brain, then thought as memory, and then action. From that action you learn. And so the learning is the accumulation of further knowledge. So you begin again knowledge, experience, knowledge, memory, and thought and action. This cycle is going on all the time with all of us. I hope I am making this clear, that every action either gives further knowledge, and though the mind changes, modifies its past experience and goes on. This is what an, a mind that's aware, awake, is doing this all the time like the computer. Experience, knowledge, memory, thought, action. And the action modifies or adds more knowledge and you go on that way. Is this clear? So, this is what we are doing all the time, which is called learning. Learning from experience. This has been the story of man. Constant challenge and response to that challenge. And that response can be equal to the challenge or not quite up to the challenge, but it learns and accumulates knowledge and the next challenge it responds again more fully or less fully. So this process is going on all the time in our minds, which is called learning. Right? You learn a language, that is, you learn the meaning of the words, the syntax, the grammar, put two sentences together and gradually accumulate a vocabulary and then if you have got good memory, you begin to talk that particular language which you have spent time on. This is the human process of learning that is always moving from knowledge to knowledge. And the book is the whole of knowledge of mankind, which is you. Am I making all this clear? Which is you. And either, please listen to this with little care and patience, either you keep that circle going all the time or find a way of moving out of that circle. I'm going to show it in a minute. That is, we're always functioning from the past knowledge, modified by the present, and moving forward. The forward is modified again, which becomes the past, and this process is part of our life. Are we getting all this? So, as I said, there is the art of seeing, the art of listening, and the art of learning. The learning is movement from the past to the present, modified the future. And that is the experiencing, 
and so on. This whole cycle is called what we call learning. That is psychological learning as well as technological learning. Right? Which means what? The mind is never free from the known. Are we all getting somewhere together? Or am I making this awfully difficult? It's not difficult. Probably, if I may point, if the speaker may point out, you are not used to this kind of thinking, this kind of inquiry, constant moving forward. So we are, as we said, our learning is always within the field of the known. And so the mind becomes mechanical. Right? If I have a particular habit and I live with that habit, my mind becomes me- mechanic, mechanical. If I believe in something, and that I repeat, 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 it becomes mechanical. So we are saying that we are living always within the area of the known. And so our minds have become a network of words, never the actual, but words, 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 and moving, changing, altering within the narrow, limited area of knowledge. Right? So, learning implies something totally different. I'm going to go, we are going to go into it together. We have said very clearly what is seeing, the, how to see the book, read the lines, how to listen, no, the, the art of listening to the book, never distort, distorting, never interpreting, never choosing what you like and don't like, what you appreciate and don't appreciate then you are not reading a book. Right? And we are saying also that we all live within the narrow limits of the known. And that has become our constant habit. Therefore our minds, if you examine your minds, is repetitive, habitual accustomed. You believe in God and you believe in God for the rest of your life. If anybody who says there is no God perhaps, then you call him irreligious. So you are caught in a habit. Now we are saying that is not learning at all. Learning is something entirely different. Learning means inquiring into the limits of knowledge and moving away from it. Right? This, is, this will be difficult. We will go into it as we go along. So, there is the art of seeing, the art of learning, the art of Listening and the art of learning, never to be caught in the same pattern or invent another pattern. The constant breaking down of patterns, the norms, the values, which doesn't mean living without any restraint. Society is now permissive. It doesn't mean that at all. This constant awareness 
of this pattern formation of the mind and breaking it down so that the mind is constantly aware, alert. Right? Now, with those three factors, listening, observing, learning, with those basic factors, well, let's read the book together. You are reading the book with me. I am not reading your book. We are reading the human book, which is you and the speaker and the rest of mankind. Clear? Please give little attention to this, because we live in a society that is so unhappy, that is in such conflict, struggle, strife, and there seems to be no end to it. And we are saying, if we know how to read that book, which is yourself, all conflict, all noise, travail, all that comes to an end, it is only then that you can find out that there can be truth can come then into your field. It's only such a mind that's really a religious mind, not the believing mind, not the mind that does all kinds of rituals, not the mind that puts on strange garb, but the mind that is free after having read completely all the book. And it's only such a mind that receives the benediction of truth. It's only such a mind that can go infinitely far beyond time. The fourth extract is from Krishnamurti's second talk in Bombay, 1978, titled the art of seeing. Please bear in mind, as we said, again if I may repeat, that we are partaking in our exploration. I am not speaking to you as a lecturer, giving certain ideas, but on the contrary, we are sharing together our problems. sharing, partaking, inviting each other to look at our major problems in life. And when we do look, as we said, it is possible without any effort whatsoever to bring about a transformation. That's the point that one has to learn the art of observation. Art means the capacity to put everything in its right place. That's the real meaning of that word, art. To put everything in its right place, so that the mind is liberated, is freed from constant disorder. So we are going to talk over together, together, I mean together, partaking in understanding 
what we mean by observing. Whether we observe at all, the trees, the birds, your wife or your children, observe. And what does observation mean? Because we are going to go into something when we, have, when we find out what it means to observe and actually learn the art of observation, we are going to go into the question of why the brain, thought, brings about images and in those images we live with those images from which arises fear. We are going to go into that together. So first, what do we mean by observing? The art of observing, the art of seeing. We talked about yesterday the art of listening. Whether we listen at all to anybody, or we are always occupied with our own thoughts, with our own problems, or if we do hear another, it is always translated according to the pattern, pictures, images that we have about that person. So there is never actual listening of another. So we are now talking over together this question, what it means to observe. Because if we are, know how to observe, perhaps we may be solve all our problems. To observe, to see. Perception is not only visual, optical, but also a great deal of psychological interference with what we observe. We, have, we observe through many conclusions. Right? Please go into it as we are talking. Observe yours, see how you look at things. You have some conclusions, and you look with those conclusions. Or you have some experience, and with, from those experience you have cultivated a memory, and that memory looks, which is the past looks, because memory is always the past, as knowledge is always the past. And with the with the eyes and memory and remembrance of the past, you look. That is a fact. So you are never actually looking. Right? So you are always looking with a distortion, with a conclusion, with an opinion. And so you never see actually what is. Your desire, your conflict interferes with observation. So we are asking, is it possible to observe without the interference of the past? The past is the observer. Right? All right, you are, I'm not, I see I'm not making myself clear. Let us bring it down to much more reality, which is when you look at your wife or your girlfriend or your husband or your guru, if you have one, and I hope you haven't got any. When you look at them, 
you have already formed a picture, an image, and, th- and that image looks, that picture looks, that conclusion looks. So there is never a direct observation of anything, of your, of your relations with another. Right? So the past is the observer, the past being your, the experiences, the accumulated memories which have become knowledge stored in the brain, cells, and that knowledge, that experience, that memory looks. And so there is always an observation which is distorted. So we are asking, can you look, observe nature, the birds, the rocks, the stray dog, your wife, your husband, without the picture you have created about that person? Can you do that? Then only it is possible to observe actually your relationship. Can you observe the speaker, this speaker, without the image, picture you have built around him? And if you cannot, your communication with the speaker and his communication with you is distorted. You don't actually listen so completely. You can only listen completely to something new. But if you come with your old habits, with your old memories, with your old in all the rest of it, you cannot possibly listen totally. In the same way, if you come with a, with a picture of the speaker, his reputation and all the blur that is round him, you cannot possibly have a direct communication with each other, because I have no picture about you, because I don't know you. Even if I knew you, I wouldn't build a picture about you. Because we must go into the world, know and knowledge. Sorry to complicate all this. Can you ever say you know a person? Can you ever say you know your wife or your husband? Or your guru or your whatever it is? Can you your boss? You have a knowledge about him, superficial knowledge, what he looks like and so on, so on, so on, or she. But you can, one can never actually say, I know, because the person is a living thing. And when you say, I know, you are then caught in the image that you have created about that person. I hope you see all this. So then you, are, you look at the person with a totally different mentality that you are actually looking a person or the nature and the beauty of the sky as though for the first time. The final extract in this episode is from the tenth talk in Sanan, 1966, titled The Meaning of Existence Can Only Be Discovered in Seeing and Listening. To look very clearly, you must have space. 
Yes. To look at a tree very, very clearly, or to look at your wife or husband, your neighbour, or the stars of an evening and the mountain, there must be space. But the space that we have created, that we own, that we know, is between the observer and the observed. That is what we call the space, isn't it? The space of the observer when he looks at the tree. There is not only a a space as time, but also space as distance. Right? Surely. That's what we call space. That's all the space we know of. The space that is created between the observer and the observed. And we maintain this space in all our existence, in all our activity. The observer always keeping a distance from the observed. And in this little space, we are experiencing, judging, evaluating, condemning, experiencing, seeking. Please, as we said, don't merely, if I may say so, merely listen or hear words. If you are merely hearing words and intellectually asserting, oh, it is so obvious, then actually you are not facing the fact. The intellect is the most deceptive thing. Intellect is necessary to reason sanely, rationally, healthily, is absolutely necessary. But the whole of life is not intellect. Anymore the whole of life is emotional, sentimental, uh, this so-called I don't know what the word is for the moment. I don't want to use a strong word. And for all of us, the space that we know is this, between the observer and the observed. If you are actually listening to what is being said by the speaker, you will not only see the actual fact, the actual reality of the space, but also if you push it further, as we are going to now, you will see that as long as this space exists, there must be conflict. This space is contradictory. Where there is contradiction, there must be conflict. 
is like the man who being empty, lonely, insufficient, life has no meaning to himself, projects a future which, in which he will fulfil through literature, through painting, through music, through some kind of experience relationship. So, the fulfilment <coughs> is the object and the fulfiller is the observer. So the observer and the observed are all, have always a space, and therefore there is always in that a sense of conflict. If one realises that, not intellectually, but actually, then what is one to do? Because space is necessary. Without space there is no freedom. We are talking psychologically. Freedom is not reaction. Reaction against to against society, becoming a beatnik or a beetle or growing long hair or this or that is not freedom. Freedom is something entirely different. And that freedom can only come about when there is immense space. Not the space which one knows exists as between the observer and the observed. That's a very small space. And therefore, in when there is that space, there is no contact. You are, I hope you are following on this. If not, it doesn't matter. It's only when you are in contact. When there is no space between the observer and the observed, then when you are in total relationship with the tree, not identified with the tree or with the flower or the woman or the man or whatever it is, when there is this complete absence of space as the observer and the observed, then there is a vast space. Then in that there is no conflict. And it is that's in that space that is freedom. Now, Freedom, as we said, is not a reaction. One can't say, well, I am free. The moment you say you are free, you are not free. Because you are conscious of yourself as being free from something, and therefore you have a gain the observer who is asserting that he is free, and therefore he has created a space, and in that space he breeds conflict. It is, this requires not intellectual agreement or intellectual desertion, disagreement or saying, I don't understand, but rather <coughs> coming directly into contact with what is, that is, seeing all your actions, 
everyday movement of action, as the observer and the observed. And within that space there is pleasure, pain, suffering, you know, all the rest of it, the desire to fulfil some, to become famous, this and that. Therefore, there is no contact with anything in that space. And contact, relationship has a quite a different meaning when the observer is no longer the observed and therefore there is this extraordinary space and hence freedom. Now, to bring, a, to understand this space is meditation, not to understand, you know what I mean, uh, again when it begins understand when, how, what to do and all the rest of it. You know what space is, if you have gone into it a little bit, not as a scientist with his astronauts, the rockets and all that, that of course, but to understand it deeply, to feel it, to be of it, to, uh, to live and let it function as part of you, as your, as your thought, your feeling of the absence of thought, to be in it is a quite a different thing. We only know space because of the object. There is space created by this tent, the space inside the tent and the space outside the tent. The space between you and the mountain. That's all we know as space, between the observer and the star which he sees of an evening the distance, the miles, the time it will take to reach. And we accept that space, live in that space, have all our relationship in that space. And we never ask of ourselves if there is a different dimension of space, not the scientific, uh, the astronauts, the people who walk in weightless state, no, that's not space at all, that's still of time of, of the observer and the observed. But we are talking of a space in which there is not the object as the observer. And it's very important to find out, not through words, because the symbol, the word and the symbol are not the reality. The word space is not actually the space. And to find out, to uncover that extraordinary space and therefore freedom. Meditation.
is of importance, not how you meditate, not the practice of meditation, not the way to maintain certain visions, practices, you know, all that childish, infantile business, which unfortunately they bring to the West from the East. One has to have a great deal of scepticism, and I hope you have lots of it. Even when you are listening to what is being said, because then you will find it out for yourself. Because, after all, you come to these meetings, to these gatherings, not to experience some new fantastic mystical state which you can easily achieve through some drug, and that is again such an, such an obvious and rather childish business. You, know, you come with a serious intention to find out for yourself not to seek, but to actually find out, find out a new flower, a new blade of a grass which you have never seen before, though you have walked on that path hundreds and thousands of times, to see something totally new. And so, when you see something totally new, discover something which is quite, which is a rebirth, which is not related to the past, your mind is made young, fresh, innocent. And meditation is important. Because it's only the meditative mind, the mind that is looking, hearing, listening, observing, aware of all its reactions, its subtleties, never condemning, never justifying, never trying to become famous, all that, just watching. Because there is nobody to answer questions. Even though you may ask a right question, the right, in the right question itself is the answer. And if you ask of another, and if you accept what another says, then you are you have become a, a foolish person. Then you are, live on faith and hope, and therefore you invite despair, anxiety, fear. But if you, in the, as you are walking, moving, acting, you discover for yourself the whole meaning of existence, and that can be discovered only when there is this state of observing, listening, never resisting, never suppressing, never defending, because when the mind is vulnerable, when the brain is no longer the animal 
the animal being greed, envy, ambitious, aggressive, violent, when it's no longer that, then it is capable totally of listening and therefore discovering, seeing for itself. And what you discover is not what you want to discover. Because human beings throughout the centuries, <laughs> thousands upon thousand years before Sumeria, before Egypt, before India, or India, before whatever, Greece, Rome, before, man has always been groping after this extraordinary state. He calls it by different names, God, creation, Brahman. Oh, he has given to it so many names according to his fancy, to his culture, Man has always hungered after it, because he realizes life itself is so short, his life, not life, his particular corner. Which has very little meaning to which he clings is so short. And knowing that there is death, he is hoping to find something far beyond time, space, knowledge. There is such a thing only when the mind and the heart are free from the known, and therefore there is vast space. It is only in that vast space there is there can be peace and freedom. And therefore, in that state only man can realize, listen to a dimension which he cannot find through whatever he does. He can only come upon it naturally, darkly, without his want. And he may find it, and when he comes upon it, that's enough. It may last a second and a life, but the second is the is the vast, timeless state. So. What is important first is to realize not intellectually or verbally, but actually that one is totally confused, which is an obvious fact. Read any paper, any magazine, go to any church, listen to any political talk. It is really quite despairing to see how terribly we are confused. Realizing that, never to escape. 
never to escape from that actual fact. Then you will begin to discover how you look at the fact, the fact of what you are actually, not what you think you should be. That's all again such, such an escape. Then you will discover for yourself you are looking at it as the, an observer and the observed and creating a space and therefore inviting in that space infinite conflict and contradiction. And when you realise all that, your mind then is in a state of meditation. Then you can go then the mind, not your mind, not my mind, mind, which is the human mind, because the individual mind is the local mind, the Gstaad mind, the Switzerland mind, the English mind, or the Russian and so on and so on. That's the individual. But the human mind is not the individual mind, and the human mind can only you can come the the little mind The individual mind has its place. You have to go to the office, you have to have your bank account, you have your little family. But that individual mind can never become the human mind. The human mind is an immense entity which has lived ten thousand years and more, and is that human mind in its travail, it is that mind that can understand a dimension which is totally new, untouched by the known.